Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I am joined by Canadian Wonder Kid backgammon superstar Ryan Ribello. You might know him from some of his YouTube videos playing under a 4PR in the UBC, even beating Mochi's PR and playing below a 3 in Battle of the Galaxy. I mean, what I mean, who is this guy? Let's uh, let's bring him on and have a chat. Ryan Thanks so much for uh, joining me today. How's it going? Uh, my pleasure for being here. I've heard so much about your YouTube channel. It's a real, real true pleasure to be here. Uh, how's it going? It's not bad. I'm uh, currently about three quarters of the way through my third semester here at university. So, so looking forward to finishing strong. Amazing. So you're studying finance at uh, university, right? Yeah, finance in the university in, next to Montreal called right. the University of Bishops. Are you still having time to play backgammon between kind of lectures and seminars and still get in your... You know, yeah, for game? sure. I find plenty of time to play backgammon. Just testing out Mark's new backgammon galaxy site he seems to be so interested about. <laughs> yeah, on the app. Like, where do you play? Do you play on your phone or on your laptop? I, uh, I, play, on, I play on my computer, my laptop, yeah. And, mostly uh, just playing XG 1v1 over and over and over again. Right, and, and and what do you play? Like eleven pointers, sevens, or unlimited games? Just just money games, money games with XG mostly. If I'm gonna play, if I'm gonna play, if I like uh, feel a need for a human opponent, I would play on uh, seven pointers on gals. Right, and um, how how many hours do you play a day, roughly, or a week? Jeez. I guess it would be somewhere. In, I mean. It depends. It varies from day to day. Obviously, I'd say somewhere between three and a half to four hours a day. I mean, just what? total, total focus. And you play like how do you play? Like with headphones on, total kind of in the zone, or or anywhere. anywhere. Yeah, most of the time. I have to have the classical music in the background. <laughs> study. Amazing, amazing. I mean, that's that's a lot, man. So three to four hours a day. I mean, how many? Like, how long have you been doing this for? Playing like that since, since COVID started. Since COVID really. started. So was that when you when you first got into backgammon in, in COVID? Uh, not at all. So my, my dad was a player. Mm -hmm. He still is a player. He's the one who, who got me involved in the game when I was a kid. I remember a funny story is he would have his account on Grid Gammon and every chance I could get, I could sneak on and play there online. But he would get furious because back then I wasn't good. <laughs> so he would get angry that I was tanking his rating. Amazing. So, I mean, is your dad like a strong backgammon player? Uh, he's probably about a PR seven and a half. Okay. So, so when you Actually, start, yeah, he's, he's currently in Cyprus. I think he just lost in the final of the of the intermediate division. So, oh, right, right. So, like, you got into it because of your dad's interest in backgammon. Is, is that? Yeah, exactly. But then That's you right. know you, you just seem to kind of come out of a blue, really, and then you were playing like this just incredible game and you know you were rising to a top of galaxy um and, and just playing this incredible pr in a very like short space of time i mean is that is that just through like the hours you put in or or is some kind of a bit more kind of to how you got so good at bad gamma i would say it's a mixture of uh, the other talents i have which is pattern recognition definitely memorizing all these type of stuff and uh, intuition is also a strong app, so that's perfect for backgammon, obviously. Yeah. So your and obviously hard work, hard work too. Just going at it, playing again on Galaxy. I think I have something like five thousand matches played on my main account there. Amazing. And like, what do you do? Like, once you've played, do you spend like another hour going over like every move? I mean, what does your uh, not an hour? I'll look at I'll download it into main X three and then look at the. Uh, Couple of my mistakes. Obviously, there was going to be, most of the time it's going to be some every single match. So realize why, how I can do diff things differently next time. That's about it. Yeah. And do you keep like a database of all your your errors and stuff? Does that? So I don't do that when I'm playing human opponents. But what I've done recently is just playing XG, and I would stop every time and make a mistake over point zero six. So I have a whole database of those mistakes over point zero six to look at. Right. So. You mentioned earlier that you know pattern your path your pattern recognition is really strong. I mean, is your do you just have a very good memory like for for, for... yeah? I always have a good memory. It's just uh, one of my talents, I guess. 
So you it's, it's like it's the cool thing about me is when I was younger, I would memorize all the capitals of the world. Wow. And I memorize <laughs> like digits of pi. <laughs> So that that's that's massive. So you you've got to memorize like probably hundreds of, of reference positions you can just draw upon. Yeah. When, so when... That, that that's how I started getting good. It's just by using reference positions. Uh, Mark Olson wrote a book called Cube Like a Boss. Yeah. Back back when COVID started, I spent time memorizing literally every single position from the book. And what I would do is when a cube action showed up, I would compare the action over the board to the book to see uh, obviously. You know what things change, what things stay the same, and uh, how to how to affect based on the on the XG analysis if it's a take or a pass or a no double or whatever. Wow, well, I mean that's that's impressive. So that certainly kind of helps, but also kind of there's more than that. Like you said, there's a hard work and the hours you put in. I mean, do you ever kind of feel just fatigued by it all, and you think, oh, I want to I want to take up something else or? Or no, you're you're just yes. So, so I, I will take sometimes breaks. I think the last thing I took was before the World Championship, maybe last. I think it was last March through like May, somewhere around there. I just didn't play at all. I was just tired of it all, mm. and that uh, I focused on school more. So I will go times where I just take a break, but I was just come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean like what do you see like the future like looking like your kind of backgammon future? Do you want to like I don't know, win Monte Carlo or, or Cyprus or like write a book or like, what are you thinking long term? <laughs> I don't have any book plans for the future, but maybe if I was thinking about starting to give lessons, actually, I think that would be a good thing for me just to get, a, get out of the gate. Uh, obviously, I can't, like, the problem with this, with me being in school is I don't have time to go to all these different tournaments. Like, unfortunately, I don't think, I don't think I'll be able to make the UBC this year either. Uh, but you know, I try to get to as many tournaments as I can throughout the year. Obviously, the World Championship is a big one for me. So it was New York coming in, in, in between my two semesters there. I'm excited for that in January. Yeah, and I, I, I heard you, man. You were commentating of the last one, right, with, with Kazaras and um, Symbol. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was Chicago. That was, that was great. That was awesome. And I thought, man, like to be commentating like that well at, at your age, I mean, that in itself is impressive, you know, that that's like another kind of skill, right? I mean, how did you find that, the commentating? Um, commentating is very fun for me. It's yeah. just just to be able to sort of, the problem with me playing over boards, I get, sometimes I get too stressed out and it causes me to lower my PR a little bit. But when you're commentating, you don't have any of the stresses of actually playing, you sort of speak freely. So it's a lot of fun. It's just playing, watching other people play back game about having you the stress of actually playing yourself. You know? <laughs> yeah. Big difference, right? Easier to kind of talk about someone else's uh, moves. Yeah, much, much easier to much easier to commentate than to play, I find. Especially in these high-pressure environments. Yeah, absolutely. And Mochi, I mean, we've just mentioned him. You played him um, in Galaxy, you know, online. But um, you went to his summer camp, didn't you, uh, recently? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I mean, so Mochi was nice enough to invite me down to Japan, uh, end of August there. He had a nice summer camp at the at, just outside of Tokyo, a place called Hakone. So I had a, a lot of fun there for three, four days. Uh, eventually, I said, you know what? If I can go to Tokyo, it might only be this once in my life. So I just extended the, the trip. I think I stayed for a grand total of sixteen days. Wow! Just in Tokyo itself. Amazing. And I mean, can you tell us about that? I mean, what did you actually do as part of that? kind of training group with Mochi? Just the training. So Mochi had, it was him, Mochi and Kazuki as three of the leaders. And then he had just all really the, all the young people in Japan uh, come and play at this training camp. So he was put us in the groups and we have sort of a training session where two people will play at a person and do the transcription over the, uh, on the computer. And then Mochi would come in and say, Hey, this is why this is wrong or the, the mistakes and stuff. And then at the end we had a nice big uh, tournament. Oh, amazing so a lot of kind of playing and, and transcription and off so after the match Moj would 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 analyze it with you is that is that what you're saying and yeah. looking yeah. through and i mean i mean how was that you know he's his kind of insights into into the analysis and was it was it like uh, i find it's, it's always fun when it, when another player decides to give their analysis over the board because it's diff it's always going to be different than what i see over like individually but just seeing someone else's insights, it's always, it's always helpful to think. It's like, hey, how did you get to 
or how to get to this position because the way I might, might, might come to the same answer, but the way we do it is different. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean, what do you think you kind of took away from that experience? Do you think any, any massive mm -hmm. improvements in, in your game? Did you, did you change anything about the way you play? Yeah. The biggest thing for me is just seeing the work ethic of these guys like Kazuki and Mochi. Because I mean, they pl they're playing more than me, and they're playing high pressure to me, and they're always playing in these uh, in these high event, you know, cash games. Yeah. So it, I mean, it's not something that I'm really involved in too much. So just seeing how how much they want to put into the backgammon, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that kind of commitment and focus, and you know, other players have said on my channel that you know Japanese players have this incredible you know focus when they play. You know, nothing nothing affects them. It's a kind of stoicism, right? You know, they they so emotionless when they're playing, in a sense. You know, you know what I mean. And nothing. Sure. Um. And and. Um, <laughs> go ahead, yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna say that uh, Mochi. I mean, uh, there were times during my trip where I would go play just against Mochi or Kazuki at their house there. And it's just like, there's no talking. They just both want to play the best PR they can every single time. So it's just <laughs> that kind of work that it, that it takes to be one of the best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's impressive, right? Because I'm sure you've seen and, and maybe felt to yourself but the emotions of the game, you know, uh, which which you said can sometimes have an effect on your, your performance, right? Um, I mean, what do you do to kind of stay like cool and level-headed when you're playing? Is it like classical music, like you said, or the other strategies? Uh, so what I try to do is every after every decision, because when I in the past I would get hung up about every single decision I would make over the board, mm -hmm. right? So let's say I take a, I take a cue and I'm really not sure if it's a take or a pass, and then and then the problem is that this thought of whether it's being wrong would stay with you throughout the rest of the match and just always be a thorn in your side. So what I've done is once you make a decision, that's it. You just move on to the next one and whatever you think doesn't really matter. Mm. And it helps with sort of being level-headed a little bit. Yeah, makes sense. And, um, you know, backgammon, like, like what advice do you have, Ryan? Obviously, you know, you, you know, you play this amazingly high level and, you know, you're getting better and better and, you know, it, it's very impressive, you know, to watch you play quickly and you often find the correct play. I mean, people you know who are intermediates or advanced players, like what you know, what can you say to them, you know, to really kind of help them improve improve their game further? Uh, I guess you can say just keep at it. You know, if backgammon is really something you want to be good at, it's like anything else, it takes hard work more than anything else. Hmm. So just try to play, try to play XG over and over again. Realize your mistakes. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, if you play a game, you should not have it unanalyzed, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there's no way to learn from a, a match that's unanalyzed. Hmm. And also, what I would say is try to get as many tournaments as possible. Because uh, the, the, the tournament game is a lot different than me playing on home at Galaxy. Even I found that. My PR is significantly higher during the tournament. So the more tournament experience you get, obviously, the, the better you're going to become at it. Yeah. Yeah, totally, man. And... I think, like you said, the time you put in, you know, the effort and the hours really kind of stacks up, right? And I mean, if you're playing four hours a day backgammon, I mean, how many people are really even playing, you know, close to that? You know, some people may, may be playing four hours a week backgammon, right? And, you know, you've got to put the work in, right, if you really want to want to succeed. Yeah, I would say so. And... So what about BMAB? Are you like, are you thinking of like going for like Grandmaster, a BMAB and stuff? Have, have you thought about that? I'm, I'm not too concerned about it, to be honest. Uh, obviously, when they have, if they have a BMAB tournament in New York, I'm playing that. But uh, to be honest, I see something that's happening gradually better than me just spending a bunch of time improving my BMAB rating, as it should. You know, it should just be this gradual process, I thought. I yeah. Absolutely. So that's something maybe you'll, you'll look into in the future after your studies or you're not sure. Yeah, yeah perhaps. But obviously we're now I'm more and more concerned with uh, with my with my studies and then obviously improving my BMAP rating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, this is what we're going to do then, Ryan. Thanks for coming on the channel, you know. So I had this idea of 
showing you um, 12 positions, right? Um, now, these positions are just randomly chosen from a database of checker errors going back like many years. And I just want you to look at a position and try to find the best move. Now, some of these might be like super easy for you. Maybe they will all be super easy. Some of them might be more difficult. You want me to go fast? Uh, <laughs> it's up to you, you know, try to find the right answer. Tell me what it is. And then I'll show you the, the, the answer afterwards, right? Um, and then you can say something Sorry. about kind of why why it's a correct move, right? How does that sound? Yeah, all good? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right, so so here we go. Now, Ryan has never seen these positions before as well, right? Never seen them until this very moment. No, never seen. It's not, it's not some pre-planned thing, so I can't <laughs> be wrong. It's not pre-planned. And guys, if you're watching and you want to have a go, then just pause you know, the video, have a think about the position and, and try to find the best play. So here we go, 12 positions. Also, no cube decisions and no doubles. Um, so just kind of normal rolls um, and they are all kind of money games as well with, with Jacoby, right? So number one, why to play a three two? Yeah, you have to hit here, I think. Everything else is just too passive. Okay. Um, are you sure? Do you want to have a... <laughs> Pretty wanna... sure. I guess I'm wrong. It's not, it's not correct. Okay, I think this first one might be a little Oops. difficult. Um, that's not. That's actually not the, the correct play to, to make the hitting play. So what else could you do? So the only other play I see is we play 22 and 6 to 4. Okay, so so there we are. Small error on plus plus to make the hitting play, and that's Actually, like... it's a sizable error. Yeah. So um. Yeah. So the the thing is, is you don't have the extra spare any eight point, right? I think that's it, isn't it? You don't, you know, you're stripping, you know, the eight completely. Um, what else is going on here? Is anything else interesting? Do you think about why is it just i mean you, you, you never really want to play six four so i was trying something more aggressive to try to get us back into the game here mm. but uh it obviously it's just breaking the end point it's just it's a nice priming point there's no reason to no reason to break it yeah so okay 11 to go that first one may be a bit tricky let's look at this one <laughs> why to play five right, let's try harder then do that I would make the three point. I think. And and it's more and, aggressive. And, and hit, yeah. I'm afraid. Oh, that's wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, it's, me here. Good job. <laughs> it's a learning channel, you know. So I mean, but yeah, right. It looks correct to make the three point to unstrip the six. But yeah, here, just making the four prime is is so strong. I mean. What's going on here? Why, like, why is a five point better than a three point? Do you think? It's just it's just a solid four prime. I try to try to hit, hope to get into. I mean, anchoring is not the end of the world, but hopefully try to bliss him here, try to get our back checkers out. But it just wins far more games just to make the make the five points. So it's a better play. Yeah, absolutely. There's an increase in wins. I think making the five. I mean, unless your opponent then rolls like a one to anchor up. You're just gonna like smash him after that, right? Yeah, but uh, I don't like doing that because you see that that you stack there. Obviously, it's just it's too much, too much of an improvement to make the five. It's interesting, you know, because these last two positions, like I made the same play as you. I I made the three point here. It was wrong, and the previous one I made a hitting play. It was wrong, so I don't know, man. Maybe we're too aggressive as as backgammon players or something. But... Yeah, I, I'm a bit too aggressive in my my play. That's often the mistake. So yeah. um, let's move forward. Number three, white play five four. So you don't want to split into the stacks. I will bring two down off the midpoint. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you got it right. Yeah, you can't be splitting into the big stack of like the blitz structure. And I kind of like these moves, how they kind of defy kind of common sense. Like, you know, don't strip the midpoint. 
However, here you do strip it, right? Because there's no good alternative. Yeah. Well, when you see that just a double five, really double five, it's just like a red flag to not split into it. Yeah, good point. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about your opponents like Joker Roll. So your, yeah, your opponent has a blitzing structure. Splitting would be it would be playing right into his hands. You just want to sort of bring two down, try to make your, your air points. Yeah, because fives play pretty badly, right? With, with you know, not, not splitting the back checkers. Yeah, he'd have to yeah come down from the midpoint all right nice one two down um four one to play number four So 13-9 for me, and one is probably just making a 23-point, I think. Trying to help prime him. He has a dilly builder on the, on the three-point. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, very good. Anything else here is a blunder. Yeah, so well done for finding that. I mean, I think a lot of players would be reluctant to kind of make that 23-point anchor, right? Um, yeah, usually usually I end up making it too often, to be honest. There's some times where you don't want to make it 23-point, but... This time, this time it's a clear giveaway. Just having the the builder there on the, on the three point, mm. it yeah. just it just freezes it up too much. You go, you game plan here behind the race, trying to help prime him. So just making any anchor you can, just to kill all the blitz value while you're at it. Yeah, nice, good point. And you arrive right, a dilly builder there on his three points just becomes like redundant right after after you make any anchor. Yeah, interesting one. Um, good. Number five, uh, three checkers on the bar and the cube has been turned, right? Six, three. So 13, seven is clear, I think. Just to bring a Nessar builder into the ace point. And if three didn't really hit, they're gonna step up. I would actually step up, I think. 23, 20, 13, 7. Second best play, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so yeah, you're just, just picking up like the fourth um, checker there. I, I, it's kind of tricky, this one, because I think you can sometimes overplay the blitz. You know, you can end Yeah, up I find that too. Too many kind of. Here, you're too concerned about getting your back checker out. You should be more concerned about him making the anchor. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. You just don't want him to have the 22 point anchor. So you've just got to smash him off that. Um, and maybe like the Q placement, you know, is, is part of this uh, as well. Do you think that possibly changes a decision having a cube on on his side? No, it shouldn't. No. Actually, may, maybe if it's in the middle, maybe you just want to keep lower volatility. Mm. But these numbers here is probably not the same now. Because it's going to be too good anyway, most of the time. Uh, yeah, I think you're completely right here. Like making, preventing him from making that anchor is is like really crucial, right? And and even if you get hit back, I mean, he's got so much work to do, right, to bring those checkers all in all into the board. Um, yeah, often they're running the back checker. Like Mark Olson's mentioned stuff about that. That a really common error is people don't escape the last checker. Right, and they just hope and hope for like a th you know a three five three six three four, and it just never comes, and then their front position just gets like crunched. Um, anything else to say about this one, uh, Ryan? No, I'm just talking about the anchor. Right, number six, white play six two. I would run to the 13, I think. Yep. Well done. Yeah, so running. This one, is, this one is easy to me. Yeah, again here, even with like, you know, being 28 pips behind, you can't, you know, you can't stay there, right? On the, on the no, you, you can't stay there. It's, it's actually a nice roll there to run out. Yeah. And again, this is another one that kind of goes against like the rules because, you know, stay back when you're down in the race. 
but yeah you can't <laughs> just gotta just gotta get moving um you know what you know why is making a four point just so bad here it's like a mega blunder well it's because you didn't, you didn't get blitzed off four it's gonna happen yeah you have a, you have a nice try to try to make your points next time it's, it's, it's i mean it's a really nice roll to run out yeah i guess here as well green could even hit you loose you could dance and then you could just get cubed out right yeah you're in trouble you're in big trouble yeah so good nice one number seven um white play six one what do you reckon? I would probably jump out of past the prime and climb the base. Yeah, so. 16, it's 6 5 and all fours. And it's like 4 to 3. Doesn't seem right. I'll go to 16. So just run to 16, yeah? Okay. Yeah, hitting twice is, is better. Yeah, this is like hard, man. <laughs> this one. Just the kind of the double slotting play in, in your home board. I mean, what like, what do, you, what do you think about this one, Ryan? Can you can you explain this? Like why that's a, why it's a best play? Or? I guess you just have to go for it, right? You're not going to lose in a situation anyway. You have to try to take some issues, right? Or to make your prime points when it counts. Yeah, play to win, I guess. I suppose if you jump yeah. out here, you're just still leaving uh, like fives to hit, right? Um, and then indirect numbers to hit. and Fives or fours, yeah. Yeah. And here, I guess. I know this, one, this one's tricky. I think so, yeah. This is this is a tough one. I guess with the hitting play here, if he doesn't roll a five or four, like you're in super good shape, you know. It's like a double tiger type move. Um, he, you know, even if he hits one of the checkers, then you can have an anchor. Um, man, it's a hard one. <laughs> anything, anything else about this, Ryan? What do you think? Yeah, you just have to. You have to try to take a turn during the game around. Well. Yeah. I guess it's one thing. It's only less than the one thing there. Play to win. I should say. Right, now these positions are completely randomised, you know, and man, I don't know if you've just got some really like t tough decisions today, but uh, well, we'll keep going. Um, four two, for for white. Okay, so you go in through your nine points, so you might have a clear of a seven, I guess. Yeah, nice, clear of seven. Um, why is this? Just because of race being close. Your race is too close to to go open up your fives. Six, five, six, one. Yeah. yeah, so so this is a good one, I think. You know, often kind of clearing from the back, you know, is the right idea, clear from the rear. Um, but the race here is just too close. You can't allow him to get lucky and, and beat the checkers. Is that just it, really? Um, yeah. And just in six, six, five, it's too big of a swing to give up. To, yeah, so again, thinking about those kind of roles and I guess bringing them in kind of gives you kind of good distribution as well with like a spare and a five. Um, so if you come... Well, so does breaking the nine point. It's also from distribution. The biggest thing is just you don't want to... It's, I mean, it's, double, it's actually three rolls. It's double five and it's six by. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Good. Um, number nine. Uh, why to play five four? He's got one on the bar, right? So the four plays itself. Yeah, I see it. So obviously come in and you have fives. You can lose me. Hold on. It doesn't seem right to come out. It doesn't seem right. Yeah, I, I would just unstack, try to get him off the edge point. Um, Frey not. 
Yeah, it looks so tempting, man, to unstack here, right, with six checkers. I mean, I guess his home board is just too strong for you to be taking that risk. I mean, is that it? I mean, what? Yeah, but I don't see as much of a risk. I mean, it's like like last time I tried to try to just turn the game around. Mm. Now. Yeah, this is a mistake I made. You know, I I I made the hit in play here. Um, didn't like to strip the midpoint, um, attacking the blot, but yeah, it's pretty, it's not right, you know? Yeah, it's sizing. Um, do you think it's just because of like Green's home board or like, like why is, why is this not right? Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing is you don't want to put a checker on the ace point. Right. I don't. mean, if you had a five point made, the, the fire, the, making the hitting, the hitting claim must be correct. But because now you're just not hoping for anything, right? Just wasting a checker for almost no reason. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. I mean, because ones are duplicated as well to hit you and, and safety that blot in the outfield. So kind of, this kind of pushes you towards kind of making the hit in play. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't like, I wouldn't like making the strip, strip in the eight point either. Mm. Yeah, interesting one. Okay, um, number 10. So four one, you probably want to make a nine point and then find an ace. Six to five. Yeah, six to five. I'll play thirteen nine, six to five. Yeah, good instinct. Yeah. So that's an easy, easy one for me. Yeah. So this one is good, right? You you make the blocking point six away, you on stack. Um yeah. You know, again, I mean I wonder, you know, whether you know, other players would find this as easily, you know, whether they think of leaving a blot on the midpoint and, and so on. But like, why is this? Well, he has a blot on his own board, right? So I sort of lets he do it a lot easier. Right. Sort you... of keeping the aggressive slot to make the, the full five prime. Yeah, good point. Do you, like, do you think this would still be correct if uh, his blot was covered in his home board? Would, would you still kind of make this play? That's harder. Same numbers. Probably not, actually. I think, I think you're ahead in the race enough now. It's too much to leave a double shot. Obviously, you're still making the nine point. I think you're supposed to play seven six with it, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Interesting one to play around with on, on XG, I reckon. Okay, cool. Um, number 11. So you got this one and one more, right? Um, what, six two to play for white? So six is easy to come out and get to find a two. Either down to the 12 point or just playing to 11. 6 to 4, and double 5 is fine. I'm going to play to 11, try to, try to get a better uh, 2014, 13, 11. Yeah, well done. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, again, you know, I don't think that's super easy to find the right play here. Um, I reckon a lot of people would play 13 to 5. Um, the people would play 20 to is what they would do, but you want to try to play 13 11 because you're behind in the race and you want to improve your, your chances of making one of those one of those outer board points, 7, 8, 9, 10. Is that why it's best kind of jumping off the anchor and being in one down? Because you're just trying to make like extra points? Yeah, and, and improve the off-field control in case he wants to jump out in 22 point range. Right, so when you can hit him back, yeah, nice. And and why is it better to like be on the eleven than the twelve, just because you have more checkers in the outfield to hit him back with? Is is that what's kind of yeah, good? and that and it's, and the more numbers to make the make an outer board point, right? Right, nice. So yeah, diversification and yeah, cool. Kind of all plays into like these kind of concepts, right? Um, and Mark's really good about stuff, you know, on like flexibility, diversification, all that kind of key stuff. Um, and in this one, 5-2, last one, Ryan. Wow. <laughs> Do you want to come in 23? Yeah, I'll come in on 23 and play 13 and 8, I think. I don't think there's another reason to leave anyone else. Yeah, so that's what I did. Um, but it's better to um, come in on the 20 and uh, bring one down. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, what's going on here, Ryan? What's what's this about, do you think? Leaving a direct six to start with? I guess you're just too scared of getting primed. Hmm. You know, I like to come in, when there's usually a blot in the opponent's other board, you want to come in on the low points, right, to try to keep pressure on that. But I guess he just makes it too often and it becomes too much of a liability to have it there, I guess. Yeah. Also, your thing is your head, right? Your head two pips after her roll, right? So that definitely plays. If you're behind more, like, well, let's say your eight point is now your 21 point. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that my play would be correct. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, like, not an easy one. I guess maybe here coming down to 11, that if he does get a six, he's going to have to like sacrifice he, his anchor, right? And then, unless he rolls like six one, six three, um, or something like that, then he's not going to be able to cover the blot in his home board, so he can end up in a worse in a worse situation. Um, yeah, but you're right. Kind of look, usually coming in lower, putting pressure on that blot is something something you kind of see a lot of. Um, so there you go. Ryan, 12 positions. I mean, how, I mean, how, how was that? Uh, they weren't easy to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got a lot of them wrong, so I'll go look at them later. Um, but anyways, thanks for having me. It's, it's my pleasure to be on here. Yeah. Ryan, thanks so much for coming on and, you know, offering your insights and learning about your journey is, is definitely really, really cool, man. And, uh, you know, you play amazingly well. I mean, like these positions, I gave you no time really to think about them. I just threw them up. So, you know, a lot of them weren't easy decisions. Um, but, but it is what it is. Right? It is what, may, you know, we all know you play well, dude. So <laughs> it's like, you know, I mean, amazing player. I mean, at your age and just playing, you know, like a three, four PR, it's just astonishing. And, um, you know, to keep keep grinding it down, man, and good luck in your studies. Um, yes, sir. Thank you very much for having me again. Thank you so much, Ryan. I wish you all the best, and I hope to see you at a tournament someday. You know, come to the come to the UK and play in the tournament. UK Open, maybe we'll see. UK Open, come and give a talk. Yeah, man. Well, uh, thank you very much. Check out my other guests on my channel, um, and like and subscribe. Thank you very much, Ryan. All the best, mate. See you around. Take care. Have a great one. Cheers. Bye-bye. See you later.